Hi, and welcome to the Ontario Pesticide Vendor Certification Course. My name is Steve Speller. Today we're going to be talking about pesticides in the environment. Why is it important to reduce the use of pesticides? We need to try and protect our health, uh, the health of pollinators and other beneficial insects, streams, lakes, and other water sources, the soil quality, and the quality of our crops and animals. When we talk about pesticides in the environment, we need to consider this formula. So the environmental risk consists of the persistence of the pesticide times the mobility of that pesticide times the non-target toxicity times the volume of use. If any of those items are extremely high, we increase the amount of environmental risk. In the past, in Ontario, um, the Ministry of Environment, Climate Change and Parks has done a lot of testing of surface waters in Ontario. So this includes uh, the Great Lakes, uh, smaller lakes, streams, rivers, uh, ponds, and other water area, surface water in, in the province. And the data I'm showing you right now is from the years 2002 to 2011. I know that's a bit older data, but it points out a few things. So in the chart above, you'll see at the top, you'll see the pesticide that we're talking about. In this case, it's atrazine. Um, and the next column tells us the number of samples with detectable amounts. And yes, I know today that we can measure in parts per uh, billion and trillion, but uh, nevertheless, 93% of those water samples during that 2002 to 2011 period contained 93% or 93 of them had detectable amounts of atrazine. Of that 93%, in the next column, it shows that 3% of those samples had, uh, they exceeded the aquatic life guideline of the water. In other words, it could be harmful towards aquatic life. On the far right-hand column, we see that 1.5% um, contained atrazine that exceeded the drinking water guideline. So that water was not safe to drink because of atrazine. Now, let's go back to our formula briefly and talk about atrazine. So, atrazine, one of the good parts of atrazine, it's very persistent in the soil. That's why it was a good weed killer. It would give us season-long control of certain weeds. Mobility. Obviously, it's very mobile pesticide because we've got it, had it in the water at 93% of those locations. Non-target toxicity. Fortunately, with, with atrazine, it's not incredibly toxic to other organisms. And the volume of use prior to those dates was extremely high. So there were cases back in the 70s and 80s where it was one of the few products we had to use on corn. And sometimes there was three, four pounds per acre on continuous corn. So the volume was extremely high. So therefore the environmental risk with atrazine was high. Let's go back. Now we look at metallochlor, for example, 52% of the samples had detectable amounts, 0.2 exceeded aquatic life guidelines, and there was none of the samples that exceeded the drinking water guidelines. So fortunately, we don't see any other products here that exceeded the drinking water guidelines. 2,4-D, 82% detectable, 0.5 exceeded aquatic life guidelines. And again, zero drinking water guidelines were, were exceeded. Dicamba, which is uh, the active ingredient in Banville and PAR3 and a few other products, 73% um, of those samples were exceeded, or sorry, had detectable amounts, and 0.3 exceeded aquatic life guidelines. So now we get to uh, Lorsban, and we see a real change in numbers. So only 5% had detectable uh, amounts of Lorsban. However, 95%, or almost all of them, exceeded the aquatic life guidelines. Uh, since this time, Loris ban has been, uh, the registration has been removed. So there's other pesticides here as well. Now, what I'd like to do next is take you to some more recent data. Um, 
So this is Ontario surface waters once again. It's in a little different format, uh, but this is data from 2012 to 2017. And what's interesting, and we'll look at this detectable amount of the product. So 24D, now we see it at 65%. Um, one of the other products that was on the top of the list was atrazine. So atrazine is now at 30% detectable. Okay, so we've greatly reduced that number from, from the original amount. And partially that is from changes in registration on that product. Instead of using numerous pounds active ingredient per acre, we're now using half and a quarter pound per acre active. So greatly reduced in the overall use and um, a lower use rate as well. Dicamba is another one that we saw that was is now down to 17 percent um, so it'll be interesting to see now that we have dicamba tolerant crops will that number creep back up so these things change over time and and it's just the importance of these two um, tables i believe is that we need to consider and remember that everything we do when we're applying a pesticide may have effects down the road so it's important to uh, consider that. So let's talk next about what happens when we spray a pesticide. How does it break down and so on. So pesticide fate is, a, is affected by physical processes. So degradation is a breakdown of, my, of pesticide by microbes. Uh, pesticides also break down by chemicals, sunlight, and it's measured by half-life. Bioaccumulation is the buildup of a pesticide in animal bodies. Biomagnification is when uh, pesticides are absorbed by smaller uh, life and it works up through the food chain. Physical and chemical process, processes of pesticides. So pesticides sometimes get absorbed uh, by binding to particles, clay particles. Uh, adsorption is when pesticides move into organisms, and volatility or when a pesticide can change into a vapor and be given off into the atmosphere. There are natural processes as well. Uh, drift is the off-target movement. Um, you may argue that that's not a natural process, but um, surface runoff, so during uh, heavy rains, uh, water, uh, pesticide could be washed away with the surface water. Leaching is when the pesticide moves down through the soil. And soil erosion is when a pesticide that's attached to those soil particles uh, moves with that soil being eroded off of a field, either by wind or water. Another thing to consider is, are you in a uh, protected area for municipal drinking water? Uh, some of you may be familiar with these blue signs at the bottom of the screen, and that indicates that you're in a source protection area. Uh, on the right-hand side is an example of a map that you might see, um, and this is this little spot here that says A, that's where the wellhead is, and you can see there's different colors and different uh, areas, and basically those areas that are highlighted with the different colors, the water flows uh, naturally towards that wellhead and in some cases there may be restrictions on what can take place in those areas whether it be livestock, uh, pesticide use or fertilizer use. Um, this Municipal Drinking Water and Source Protection Act are a direct, direct result of the tragedy in Walkerton uh, that was over 20 years ago. You can go online and look at uh, a source if you want to find if you're in one of those areas uh, or if say you were planning on moving and buying a farm somewhere um, you can go and google source protection information atlas and you can zoom into whatever area you are in so I just pulled up this map this has London city of London on the left in southwestern Ontario um, and you can see that there's there's one you know all these colored areas are wells 
there's not much for a large city like London because London primarily draws its water from pipelines that come from Lake Erie and, and Lake Huron. Now, as you get further away from the lake, so here's the town of Ingersoll, town of Woodstock, you can see there's numerous municipal wells and you can tell that those municipalities draw their water from municipal wells and not directly from the Great Lakes. Another thing we'd like to touch on that's very important is protecting bees from pesticide poisoning. So there's a few basic rules to uh, think about when you're applying any pesticide. It does not have to be an insecticide. There are herbicides and fungicides that also can be toxic to pollinators. Uh, when we talk about bees as well, we're not strictly talking about honeybees. There are many natural occurring bees that, um, and other pollinators that are in our environment. So rule number one is do not spray any flowering crop. A flowering crop is always going to have bees in there foraging. Always follow the label directions. Um, it's fairly straightforward. Read and follow the label. Uh, choose a pesticide that is the least toxic to bees. So let's say there's a pest that we're going to try and control in a, in a field. And we look in the publications, the OMAFRA publications, and we find that there are three pesticides, three insecticides, for example, that can control the pest we're going after. They may be ranked as extremely hazardous to bees, moderately, or a low hazard to bees. And if you're able to get the control and can use something that's lower hazard to the bees and pollinators, that is by far the best choice. Also, it says to apply when bees are not active and after 8 p.m. So bees go back to the hive for the evening. Um, and that's the time if you do have to do an application to uh, do so. Communicate with beekeepers. It's important both for beekeepers and farmers to communicate with each other. If somebody's moving hives to an area, uh, they should find out who has the adjoining fields and farms, talk to them and say, hey, I'm gonna put hives there, and vice versa. If you notice that there's hives next door to you and you don't know who they belong to, ask around and find out. There's also on the right-hand side of the screen, there's some there's an app called Be Connected. Uh, you can register your own um, name and farms on there, and uh, beekeepers should as well. And by using this app, it will communicate to each other and saying that yes, I've got bees in this area, or I have farmland, and it will you're able to communicate with each other. 